Hi, everybody. Welcome to Custody Matters Live. My name is Danica Joan, and I have a very special guest with me today, Mark Ludwig, who is the founder of Americans for Equal Shared Parenting. And today we're going to talk about his uh, national conference that's coming up. It's the third annual National Equal Shared Parenting Conference, and it is being uh, held in St. Louis in June. Welcome, Mark. Ah, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Tell us a little bit about the, the conference. Tell us who's going to be there and tell us what are uh, people who show up, what are they going to learn? Um, yeah, thanks for asking. It's uh, what we try to do is educate people. We try to focus exclusively in our niche in the legislative realm. You know, there's so many different aspects to uh, shared parenting, the, the greater shared parenting community, whether it's uh, mental health awareness, whether it's judicial accountability, um, silver bullets, false allegations, parental alienation. What we try to do is focus on the legislative aspect. So it's, it's something that may not appeal to everyone, and I'm okay with that. But for those people who say, you know what, I'd, I'd like to get some laws changed, uh, the overwhelming majority of people in our community have never been in the legislative arena. So it's a totally new animal. And uh, what we've known is, we noticed we get people with the, that Dunning-Kruger effect, where in three months they think they know everything, and then they start making all kinds of legislators doing more damage than they can imagine. And six months later, they learn what they didn't know, and, but by then it's too late. So our goal is to try and educate people so they can go about it the right way. Uh, I've been involved in the political arena for 35 years now, uh, since my college days. And the goal is to try and take the information that I've learned over those 35 years and share them with people so they can apply it. So uh, we started, uh, I guess it was three years ago in Washington, DC, had our first conference. And it was a great conference. It was one of the first times to my knowledge that we had so many different organizations participating. Uh, in the past, a lot of the organizations that tried dealing with legislation felt like they were competitors instead of collaborators. And it, they were very territorial and didn't want to share information, didn't want to work with other people. They wanted, it, I don't think they started out wanting credit and recognition, but it became that. And so we tried pulling people together to let them realize, hey, there's a lot of power if we work together and try and focus on a niche. Everybody has something that they do better, sort of that hedgehog concept in the uh, Good to Great book. And I agree. I, I know. For me, it always is about like I've always been a collaborative kind of person because I get that I don't know everybody, everything and everybody. And if we can come together, then, you know, it's power in numbers. And, um, and the other thing that I notice in this movement of equal shared parenting, there's not always been a representation of somebody who has a, a like a distinction or an understanding of legislative matters and how it goes. I mean, really my last, the last time I had an education about government was, was in high school. And <laughs> I don't think I paid attention very well either. <laughs> but you're, you're right, most people, that was it, is, is it ended when school was over. So I think we try to get people to understand because all of us have strengths and weaknesses. You know, for myself, uh, I'm not a verbiage type guy. And you know, a lot of people come to me, hey, should we have this verbiage in the bill? And I, I think I'm considered in the upper, say, 1% of, of people who understand verbiage. But compared to somebody who does that all the time, and that's all they do for a living, that's not the expertise. That, and there's just, it wouldn't make efficient use of my time to spend six months spending 8, 10, 12 hours a day studying verbiage when, why don't I find people who know verbiage and I can do what I do? You know, my specialty is more the networking, the connecting, the opening doors, laying of the tables. And then let's find somebody else who has that as a strength and let's partner together. And, and as I said, in the past, there were too many organizations and people and not in any way putting people down. So I, I don't want to come across that way. I'm very sincere. It, but many people ended up becoming a one-all answer where they wanted to do everything. So that's one of the goals of this convention is we're going to go through step-by-step from the time somebody is brand new that says, you know what, we need a law changed to help them analyze, okay, what law needs to be changed in your state? And what's the easiest ones to change? Because we get some people 
that they don't understand. They want one bill that's gonna cover every aspect of shared parenting you can imagine. And we need to get them to understand, hey, it's, it's a lot easier to get one simple bill through and do follow-up bills in the following years than get one bill that's gonna have what I call the drag, where you know, you'll get three legislators that don't like this aspect of a bill and a different three that don't like this aspect. And, and pretty soon you have too many people slowing that bill down. We want the cleanest bill that has the best chance of sliding through. Now we've got momentum on our side. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna this year do something different because, because of the Corona stuff, we're not gonna have as large of uh, a crowd as normal. So we're gonna turn it into an actual case study. So I'm gonna pick two states, a blue state and a red state. And we're literally gonna go through the entire process. The blue state is probably gonna be New York. Uh, where I'm going to take that state and we're going to analyze, we're going to literally go through the background and biography of their Speaker of the House, of the Chair of the Judiciary Committee, of the members of their committee, of their state, of all the bills that have tried in the past, and say, okay, this is what hasn't worked in the past in your state and why. Now, if I were going to introduce a bill in your state, here's who I would call and here's what I would say to that Speaker of the House and what not to say. And we'll go through, hey, that speaker has, has sponsored bills in the past based on this, this, and this. So keep away from these topics. And we're going to go through every step of how to take that bill through the whole process, uh, how to go through legislative assistance, and how to go through a congressional hearing. I mean, every step of the process for both a blue state and a red state. So my, my goal is when people walk out of there, it's not a theory, it's not a rah-rah, We've given them practical stuff that they can apply. Hey, I'm ready for 2021 to get it done. You know, the, I've even noticed that in this whole pandemic that even people's views on how to handle the pandemic are, are definitely, there's blue and red. There's, this is how typically Republicans handle it and this is how typically Democrats handle it. So, and that has really very little to do with politics a lot of times um but so it, I, I find it interesting it's almost like you need you need to have a psychologist there to to tell people the psychology of the different people leaders that are in your state well see and, and you're right and i think that's the sad thing is so many people think that well gosh i can't help out you know getting a law passed because i don't understand legislation and and it's hard for people to grasp if they're not around the arena but i tell people Legislation only has about 10 to 15 percent to do with legislation. It has 85 to 95 percent to do with politics, and politics has more to do with people skills, personality temperaments, uh, the five love languages, understanding networking, and that's something that we can teach to educate people on. So we don't need the, the technical skills that most people think the best uh, lobbyist, and, and I know some people think of a lobbyist in a negative term, but to educate people, the, the reason people hire in organizations, companies hire a lobbyist is because a lobbyist specializes in networking within a capital. So they know who the players are, they know the strengths, they know the weaknesses, and it saves time from an effect effectiveness and an efficiency standpoint to hire someone as a lobbyist. But the best paid lobbyist aren't the people who have the legal expertise. The best lobbyists are the ones who have the people skills. And so that's some of the stuff that we're gonna go through. And it's almost, I give the example of the Karate Kid, which you know, I'm old enough to remember the original Karate Kid with the wax on, wax off. Yes. And you know, he got so mad at, you know, when are you gonna teach me karate? And he didn't understand that when he was doing the wax on, he was teaching him how to block a punch. And so many people say, oh yeah, yeah, people skills. Oh, yeah. You know, let's get on to the meat. Well, if you don't learn personality temperaments, if you don't learn the five love languages, you're not going to get a bill passed because you can't get past the, you know, get the relationship started with that legislator. Most of the meetings that I'm in, I'm amazed at how many people I bring in with me because as I travel the states, last year I was, I had planned on going to 29 different states. I think I made it to about 15 of them. But every state I go to, I bring people with me to do because. So I say, there's only so much theory you can teach. I'd rather bring two or three people with me. Let's go meet with a legislator in person. And then afterwards, we'll do a plan, do, check, adjust, analyze what we did. Every time I bring people with me, they're wanting to jump right into it. 
you know, hi, Mr. Legislator. Hey, let me tell you about your parenting. And, and I always tell people, you need to spend most of the time I meet with legislators, I'm not exaggerating, I will spend a minimum of 50 to 60% of the time I'm in that office talking about hunting, talking about fishing, talk. I've never hunted in my life. And I haven't fished since I was uh, used a cane fishing pole with my grandpa as a kid. But I tell you what, if there's a legislator that I can see that they're a hunter or a fisher, we're talking about hunting and fishing. Because <laughs> it's like in the business realm, people do business with people they know, like, and trust. Well, legislators do business with people they know, like, and trust. So you've got to build that relationship with them. And it's, it's not a manipulation. It's not a phony thing. You're trying to get that relationship, that trust, that confidence with that, that legislator. That's how you're going to ultimately get a bill passed. Well, you know, you're talking about the trust and the relationship. It's no different. Like it, when I was teaching in the school system, what in professional development, they, they were very clear. They, the kids don't care what you know until they know you care. Yes, and, I love that. Yeah. And so like I, that is in everything because we're ultimately, we're just, a, a, I always tell people, I'm like, we're just adult five-year-olds. <laughs> it is, it really is true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're going to go through a lot. And then um, in the past, I've had it in DC, which is, as you know, from planning events, it's a logistical nightmare to try and plan an event 700 miles from your hometown. <laughs> so this year, I decided, you know what, I'm not even going to fight it. In, in the past, we did DC because the backdrop of the nation's capital was cool. And originally, we were thinking, oh, we'll be able to get some legislators to stay over. The challenge is every legislator at the federal level leaves town on Thursday afternoon to go back to their district. So if you're having an event on a Friday and Saturday, they ain't in town anyway. So you just spent all that money for the backdrop of DC. So instead, we're going to have it in St. Louis. It's a lot easier for me to plan logistically. And the neat thing in St. Louis is because I've got a lot of contacts, uh, you know, quite a few in, in Missouri with legislators at the, you know, in the Missouri State Senate that we can bring so that we don't, aren't just given theory. I can bring a lot of these legislators to do Q and A's with the participants uh, so that they can hear from the legislators themselves in Missouri. I think that's wonderful. And you know, St. Louis is not a bad tourist town uh, with the St. Louis Arch and, and the Mississippi River and, and all that. And it's economically, you know, Southwest Airlines, it's halfway through the country. And so, you know, we had, um, I guess it was last year, um, Father's Rights Movement had an event in Vegas, and we had ours in Washington, D.C., and people kind of had to choose, because they didn't have the money, because it was quite expensive to fly for West Coast people to fly all the way to D.C., and so what we ended up with is people had to choose, and so instead, they're having theirs in Nashville in September, we're having ours in St. Louis, but it's we don't lose the West Coast people that have to spend an entire day traveling back and forth each way. So most of the places in the country and Southwest, especially right now, uh, I'm hearing of people that are getting round trip airfares for 140 bucks into St. Louis. So it's a uh, that's awesome. Very and economical place. You've also been able to get get them to give a cut rate on the uh, conference hotel. Is that right? Yeah, we have the uh, Drurians, who Tim Drury's a friend of mine. He lives here in St. Louis. And uh, his hotel is like the gold mine right now because on Highway 55, Illinois is totally shut down. All of St. Louis and St. Louis County, you can't have more than 10 people at anything till the end of June. The very first hotel you come to, if you're driving through Illinois, through St. Louis, the very first hotel you come to is the Drury Inn and Suites. It's one of their nicest hotels, a beautiful hotel. And uh, so not only do they not have, you know, a problem getting people, they are like shooing people away. So, but we were able to get them, their normal rate is 134 a night. We got them down to 99 a night. And uh, like I said, just a, it's a beautiful hotel. It's a great intersection, plenty of restaurants around. So it should be um, a, a really nice venue to have it. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it because I mean, that's the thing is a lot of times we know how, like, we know it's important to get to our legislators, but uh, our legislators are not experts in what we know. What's passionate about, like what we're passionate about, which is the equal shared parenting, we almost, we, we need to um, 
if we learn about what the legislator needs to know, we know, we can talk their language and get them to pass bills that um, that are the most effective. Because you know, as you know, most of the country is are you know the states are shared parenting states. But as you said, shared parenting is something like oh yeah, you have them a couple days a month. I'm sharing that portion with you. That's not the same as equal shared parenting and a legislator may not know the difference. Yeah, that's what I found getting into this is so many people are so mad because of what happens to us and, and we're getting mad at the legislators. Why haven't you done anything? Most of the legislators I've talked to, they were like, Mark, I had, until it happened to you, because you know, I used to be very active in, in Missouri politics and they watched my situation with Levi and, and I've had so many legislators say, Mark, if it wasn't you that it happened to, I, I wouldn't have believed there's a problem. And even myself, you know, I knew people that had every other weekend until it happened to me. I didn't really think there was anything wrong until I started studying the, the psychology of what happens to ch children growing up, missing half of that. So as you said, it's big part is educating. And that's why I want a lot of my friends that are legislators to be coming in and and doing talks and Q and A, so people can hear from other legislators that you know, hey, it's, it's not that we're against you. We just we didn't know, and and they can tell people because a lot of times, if people hear from me that the the group that follows me, there comes a time where they're like, oh yeah, yeah, Mark says this, but I think if we can get them to hear from a third party and say, look, I know Mark looks like a dork, but he kind of knows what he's talking about, and and this is right, and, and so we're gonna have them to be able to say, hey, this is the way to really reach a legislator. Uh, we also have a couple um, like Ed Martin, who's been a advisor to several presidents, was an advisor to Pope uh, John Paul II. Um, the direct person who Phyllis Schlafly herself, and Phyllis Schlafly is one of the first people that started raising the flag saying, hey, there's gonna be a problem with this Title IV-D funding and you're gonna create a fatherless society. And she said that 30 years ago. So, uh, but the one she dubbed that after she died, she wanted to take her place was Ed Martin. And so we still don't know for sure if he's gonna be in a person, high, high likelihood he's gonna be in person, but second best, he'll do a, uh, a Zoom conference, but he'll do a Q and A with the audience too, because Ed is very, very familiar with our, uh, more than most people would imagine, uh, matter of fact, more than most of us on the issue, on Title 40 funding, the problems it's caused, who are the main players are in Washington, D.C. So it'd be kind of a neat treat to have somebody with the wisdom of an ed to do a Q&A with our audience. I'm, I'm hoping we can pull it off. I, I think we're going to do it to get them here live. And then there's also a possibility now that we'll have one of Phil Schlafly's sons. Uh, also, now that one will attend live because he lives here in St. Louis. This is going to be amazing. And there's a lot of benefits to coming to the live in-person conference. Uh, and, and as much as we've had to, like I, I, my conference, I had to shift it to an online really, really quick. Which by the way, you did a awesome job. I'm still just amazed that you pulled that off. That was great. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's so important for our parents to get, to get educated on how they can be empowered and what they can do with this stuff. Because I know, like I was sharing with you offline, is, you know, there are people I've coached through. I've coached them through their custody battle. I've also co coached them to prepare them for their mediation. And um, unfortunately, a lot of times they come to me after they the the final divorce hearing is done and it's now a year or two into it and they realize this is just not working and uh and i'm like you know there's only so much i can do after the fact to clean things up so it's super important that you get educated and uh so that yeah, you know like you bring up too is just being in person i i give the analogy it's it's the difference between listening to a song on the radio versus being at a concert or watching a ball game on tv versus being in the stadium you can't describe how much more you gain from a conference by being in the room live where it's being held but more importantly some of the best things that come out of a conference are the connections you make in other states because there will be times next year we've got a lot of states next year there's five states that i believe have a very very good chance of passing next year 
Well, if we can get legislators from one of those states talking to another one, we've got an even better chance to really play up that momentum. Well, it helps for the players in those states to, to have met each other in person to say, oh yeah, yeah, I met this person from South Dakota. He was at the conference. And now they've got the connections themselves instead of just, oh, Mark talks about this person. No, it's they've about met the them. relationships. You go, yeah. It goes back to what you're saying. The core are the relationships. You've got um, to meet these legislators. You've got to have a relationship with them before they care what you, what you have to say. And this conference, which that's the one thing that is missing from an online platform, is the relationships. Yeah. And, and, and two, even just the friendships, even if it has nothing to do with legislation, just to know that you got some buddies with you, that they know exactly what you're going through, your, you know, your brothers and sisters in the battle, your, your family. And the, uh, you know, I think of the last two conferences we've had, that's one of the neatest things is just the, the relationships that we built, even if we never talked legislation at all, just to know that, hey, somebody else is out there. And then by being in the room, the belief that you get, because sometimes, at least in the legislative arena, there's usually only about three or four people in any state that are really going to the Capitol and trying to get something done. And there's times where you just feel beat down like it's you against the world. And I think by people being in a room with people from other states, they say, you know what? I can do this. We've got people to lean on in other states. We're all doing the same thing. It, it gives belief. It gives confidence. It gives hope. And it gives people that impetus to let's charge into 2021 instead of dragging our butts from what didn't happen this past year. <laughs> mm. It's been a, it has definitely been a, a tough year um, to, to get anything accomplished. And, um, and, but that being said, when you have situations, unexpected situations, as we all do, a lot of times that pushes you to, to think creatively. How can I think outside the box? So that, uh, because you really don't have a choice. You either think creatively to come up with a solution or you, or you just get disempowered and, um, that doesn't work. Not, you know, not for the parents that we're here to serve. Um, Got to move forward with that. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I am so glad that you came on to share with us about you know, this conference that's happening in St. Louis um, next month <laughs> in June. Yeah, it's coming up June 12th and 13th. So awesome. yeah, it's going to be a busy next few weeks making the changes in the plans. Ooh, no kidding. Like I said, we weren't totally sure we were going to be able to pull it off until last week, but you know, we didn't know whether Missouri was going to ease up the restrictions or not. And uh, St. Louis didn't. So we had to hold it in the next county just right across the border. It's technically it's only about three miles from my house, but they have different uh, Jefferson County has eased up the restrictions more than St. Louis has. Wow, that's awesome. I am going to, uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, if my internet will work, is trying to share the page. Um, but in the meantime, while I'm, it's coming up, uh, oh, here we go. Here we go. Uh, let's see. I'm going to share with you the conference page of the uh, Americans for Equal Shared Parenting conference. It is, uh, just in case you need to hear it, it's afesp.com. And that uh, that's the website that you can find out all about uh, getting a ticket. Yeah, just click on ticket registration. We have, uh, there's only two tickets available. Uh, 125 is the general admission and then 250 is VIP. Um, to be up, up front, we aren't going to be able to do as many of the VIP things as we were originally going to do. We were going to be able to do a couple of lunches and everything, but because of social distancing, and we're not going to be able to pull some of those off. So, uh, But if people can afford to do the VIP, we're going to try and do some special things for those uh, that can afford it. And uh, But obviously, I think most people know it costs a lot of money to put on a conference like this. And when you get limitations to how many people can be in the room... <laughs> Uh, it's just if, if people have been blessed and say, you know what, I want to pay back. I don't have the knowledge to, or the time to do a lot of legislation, but, you know, hey, I've been blessed financially. I could do a 250 ticket to help out with the cause. It, it would definitely help out. And then if anybody can't make it live, but wants to either donate some money or sponsor someone else to go, uh, we would definitely appreciate that. Because, you know, obviously, like I said, with limited attendance, there's certain things when you figure 
the cost of renting a major ballroom and staging and stuff like that, it, it, it's tough to break even on a conference when you're, when you're limited in the number of people. Absolutely. I totally, I get that because <laughs> I was trying to do my cl uh, conference live and in person and it, it takes something. It takes a lot of beg and begging and borrowing. And, um, and a lot of people say, do not do a conference unless it's fully sponsored. Uh, because, but I think with us, we're not willing to sell out to an agenda. Um, yeah, especially this year, like I said, I, I, my belief is that 2021, and, and I know people think, well, you know, we always think next year's the year, next year's the year, but, uh, you know, for a hundred years, the Cubs kept thinking next year's the year, but they finally pulled it off. But, uh, you know, you just, you can't give up. But I really do believe, though, next year's going to be a powerful year. And I thought to skip this year, we would take, it's, it's not like we just stay where we are. We're either gaining momentum or losing momentum. And I didn't want to take a chance of the whole, and not like we're the answer to the whole country. I, I hope it doesn't come across like that. But I do think that most people acknowledge that we are one of the, one of the top organizations leading the educational component of legislation. And so for us to take this year off, I think legislatively, we would take a hit across the country. So I would much rather, even if we you know, aren't able to break even, it's worth the expense to put this on to keep that momentum going and increase that momentum into 2021 rather than lose it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, you just got to keep on going because there's the people people's families are in the balance and, and the future of it, because I do know how a lot of times crisis, you know, when there's a crisis or there's a, uh, a crime or whatever, people are quick to make, uh, to push for legislation. And a lot of times when we step back, we realize, hmm, we didn't think about the impact, the negative impact of making that legislation go through. Um, so, and this is something, the same thing as we, know this this is not a knee-jerk reaction um, that we're asking of the legislators this is this is something that you've specialized in um, you know with equal shared parenting and its impact or the impact of not having equal shared parenting yeah but you you bring up a good point is uh, i've said many years that cr you know legislation is crisis driven and it's unfortunate but now we have something to use to our advantage to show legislators where there were a lot of situations across the country where one child was being held from a non-custodial parent because of the fear of, you know, well, that person works at a medical facility. Now, if that couple had been married and, the, and one parent worked at a medical facility, they would still come home and see their child every night. But because they were used as in an adversarial relationship, the custodial parent says, well, you know, that non-custodial parent works at a medical facilities so they can't see their child till this pandemic is over so there's a lot of non-custodial parents that haven't seen their kids in the last eight weeks yep. because of situations like that and you know at the federal level with this title 4d funding where you know with the stimulus checks you know if someone is a you know felon who got released from prison they got their stimulus check if they owe back taxes they got their stimulus check if they owe student loans they got their student check but if they're behind on child support, they don't get their child, their stimulus check. Well, what about the, the parents who a lot of people don't realize you could get behind on your chat on your um, you know child support because in many states it takes six months until you can actually get a hearing if you lose your job. Well, that bill is racking up, and many judges won't go back and make that retroactive. They're just gonna, hey, too bad, it is what it is. And so someone loses their job. Six months later, they get a hearing, but now they're back, you know, they owe back child support of, say, $6,000. And so I think this is going to help bring to light to legislators some of the problems that we have to where we can use this crisis to our advantage next year. And we're going we're to be talking a lot about that at the conference of how to use some of these situations to your advantage at both the state and the federal level in 2021. Awesome. Awesome. Well, it's time, time is up, unfortunately, and uh, I, I would like to bring on, uh, continue this conversation next week. Um, maybe you or, or some of the yeah. speakers might be able to have a conversation with me. Oh, cool. Um, oh, yeah, definitely. I would love that. 
All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this, uh, this week's Custody Matters Live. We will see you again next Wednesday. Uh, have a great evening. Thanks, Danica. Bye.